So, I've been kind of busy, but listen, I'm making this peg video now. I've had a few months to think about the demo and the snippets of dialogue we've seen and just what it means for our cast and the story that'll unfold when it does eventually come out. With the added context of the peg cast episodes too, while there are some plans for a demo release, we're currently stuck with this vertical recording courtesy of Snow. Sure, there are some clips and screenshots in better quality, but hey, at least we can stick subway surfers on the side or something. Count your blessings. One last note, once I finish going over the demo, there's just one more thing I want to talk about in relation to the chapter 1 trailer, so stick around till the end for that. Alright, let's roll. The demo immediately kicks off with Damon going to the dorm halls, explicitly being the last student to do so. Immediately, we get a short interaction with Grace telling Jet to shut up, which is a subtle way to show us that online baseline Danganronpa, the dorms have little to no soundproofing. Damon doesn't notice this at all and instead just makes his way over to his room. Now, here we see it's surprisingly upscale, aside from the bathroom. Now, there isn't any outright new information here, however, looking at his decor, there's a lot of insight to gain into his character. For one, there's this closet filled to the brim with exact replicas of his current outfit. Now, Damon's put off by this. Not because they've replicated his clothes, but as he puts it, his cardigan is a handmade gift from his parents. Now, this is surprising. As I've mentioned in my theory video here, Damon's cardigan serves to symbolize just how suffocating his talent is, symbolized by the abstract snake wrapping itself around him and the cardigan barely being buttoned up. With the revelation that this cardigan was tailor-made, that the pattern was hand-sewn by his parents, well, it paints a very clear image. However, skipping a bit forward just before Damon falls asleep, we can see just how, well, afraid he is of this situation, wanting to go back home to his parents. Honestly, going into this game, I was sort of expecting Damon's parents to be borderline abusive, but this line makes it hard to say that in good faith. What I now believe is that Damon's parents encouraged him to become an ultimate, not out of their own ego, but because they really believed it benefit him. Taking the view that the UTP and its ultimate program is a critique on academic elitism, it's easy to draw the comparison of a parent wanting their child to become an ultimate and wanting them to get into an Ivy League, for example. As we know from the official bios, Damon was argumentative to a fault which lent itself to him learning to debate and argue from any point of view. So, for a family who'd completely bought in into the holier-than-vow attitude of the UTP, why not take the easiest route to being an ultimate, even if it'd be more harmful than beneficial in the long run? Because, as we see in Damon's retort at the end of the prologue, his main concern is what his skills will enable him to do, instead of actually being good at debate. He explicitly brings up career prospects when justifying himself. And the consequences for that decision are laid out for us, with the podium located on the farthest wall of his room. Here we see a podium facing a mirror flanked by two bookcases. Now, the podium and mirror are pretty straightforward, whether it's MUN or debate, you're usually going to be practicing in front of a mirror before giving a speech. So there's nothing to really analyze, it's just a way for Damon to practice his technique. With Damon thinking about receiving an audience first, however, it again gives the impression he cares more about how people see him because of debate rather than actually honing his skills. Now. The second and far more interesting detail are the bookshelves, specifically how they're fake bookshelves. This is a very subtle detail, but it does reinforce a long-standing theory I've had. Looking at the context of where they are, it paints the impression these bookshelves would be used for reference books on whatever speech Damon was practicing. So, for them to be fake extends itself, creating the metaphor that all of the information Damon's acquired in his time as a debater is fake, if you will. And this is something that's already been hinted at with some of Damon's prologue dialogue talking about making space for his next debates, more or less ignoring anything he might have learned from this. And in this, we can find one of the greatest tragedies about Damon's character. He is a genuinely talented debater, but he's handicapped himself by solely focusing on his debating skill rather than the experiences it's brought him. As a consequence of Damon debating from any point of view, he's become used to simply ignoring any topic he debates upon and forming his own genuine opinion. Again, Damon makes no reference to the fact that, as the ultimate debater, he'd have been exposed to countless issues that he's learned about. Had it not been for him focusing on recognition and not bothering to enjoy debating, Damon would absolutely be a far bigger influence in this game. So, after Damon doesn't register the subtle own in the interior design, he makes his way to lock the door only to find this impossible. Put off, he braces the door with a chair and begins to wonder just who will be first to keel over, explicitly pinning Diana. Now, I'm not going to say I called them being foils back in my fear video because I called it back in 2022. We'll put a pin in that because now we have Damon going to bed lamenting that he thought he'd be with his people which in game reinforces the idea that Damon's insistent he doesn't mind being alone is a complete lie and cursing out Wolfgang for his naivety regarding the game. So true bestie. 
Tozu jumps in with a Tozu theater section, which between that and his general theatrics tempts me to label him as a former ultimate actor, or something to that effect. Damon wakes up and has his door kicked in by Cassidy, of all people. Here we see her referred to as the pro gamer girl, which one makes it clear Damon sees people by their titles first, including himself, and two makes it all the more interesting he refer to Akure by name. Is he the only one who he thinks has a respectable title? Does he hate him so much he can't help but get personal? Does he have bad taste in men? We'll see. Regardless, Cassidy kicking his door in without Damon telling anyone about the lock is evidence enough that at least some other people have faulty locks, but given the poor soundproofing, I'd expect it to be most if not all the dorms to be unlockable. We move on, finding out care has been taken care of and that apparently involves switching out the old cleaning supplies, which is even more evidence that this murder happened a long time ago, and given that it's unlikely those would have been notable to anyone except the killer who used them in the murder of Kara, it implies that Kara's killer has some involvement in the game, maybe even hosting it. After that, we have a quick conversation about the calendars with Diana. Again, let's put a pin in this. But for now, just know this is a very exemplary conversation in terms of how Damon's distrust screws him over. Now, for the meat. So, coming into the room, we're greeted by general ire and tension. And the feeling is mutual, with Damon describing the other student's gaze as cat staring at a toy. John is the main focus, as he relates his discovery of the Alpha Sanctuary to the other students, though he himself has barely explored it. While speaking, the trinkets are updated to show a map, featuring the layouts of the first area and the newly unlocked sanctuary. Honestly, let me just say, between Kai's line about tracking footsteps, his mention of low-carb food, the fact he regularly photoshops his photos, and the imitation piece, I'm slowly getting convinced that Kai Montiago has an eating disorder. I have two uh, party popper emojis in my script, I just want to point that out, but at the very least he has some kind of disordered eating, but I am sure that we'll see that addressed in his free time events if it is indeed true, probably. Now, while everyone's making plans to explore, Wolfgang butts in, stating that the group would be better off just leaving Damon and Eva out of it, citing their behavior at the end of the trial. In a word, this is stupid, in two, this is very stupid, and in four, Wolfgang's a fucking idiot. I do not think that if you are seriously promoting class unity, you should be excluding the two people who are most aware of the killing game and give them a reason to kill someone and get out of here. I think the only reasonable explanation is that Wolfgang's excluding them not out of any genuine concern, but because they disagree with him and he wants to make sure they do not explicitly challenge him. As much as I hate to admit, Wolfgang is too smart to actually think belittling them wouldn't have any consequence. Again, it would only take one person believing the game is real and acting on that fear to let the killing begin. This is a disastrous move without some personal reason to do it. In fact, you could draw a parallel between how Wolfgang in the UTP treats Eva. Akure, in the name of his classmate's comfort, tries to have her excluded and treated like a child with a babysitter. The UTP, in the name of their ultimate system, awards Eva with her title to ensure she cannot do anything to them. These are both acts that on the surface seem to be done out of good, but in reality are simply meant to put Eva down to fuel someone else's agenda. Add on the fact that Wolfgang's a character more focused on order, manifesting in complete trust in UTP, and it really feels like it sets up Akari for an arc where he continues to trust in his title to his own detriment. Now, the cast slowly buys into this, Kai going as far as to say he does not want to babysit the two, given how his babysitters often complain about him. Funny line or child neglect? Your call. Well, until Diana speaks up, trying to keep everyone from just ganging up on the two of them, especially Eva. At this point, you can say Diana is the only one who genuinely trusts the class, rather than simply trusting their titles or flagrantly suspecting everyone. Diana does indeed convince everyone, even for and Gakure's talent in his face with her saying that they should assume everyone is innocent until guilty. Now, those earlier interactions involving her, it's time to really get into them. For a while, I've posited the idea that Damon and Diana are foils. They are characters who perfectly compare and contrast, which I'm even more confident in with the interactions we've seen. For one, we see how Damon sort of pins Diana down as naive, even to the point of expecting her to get done in. It's fairly obvious this is a consequence of him dressing her down after the trial. As we can see, debating is how Damon interacts with the world, and as such, him besting Diana in an argument argument is reason enough to show she's below him. However, a key difference is that Damon's going to be seeing Diana for a while. It's not a debate competition where you go up against someone once and forget about them. They'll be around to butt heads as they grow and change. Secondly, there's the interaction about the calendars. This is mainly a way to show that Damon's close off nature and distrust screw him over, but Diana being open to engage with him even after what he said to her in the prologue demonstrates just how differently the two take disagreements. For Damon, disagreeing with someone is grounds for a debate. It's grounds 
wants to beat them at it. But with Diana, it's as she says, even if she doesn't agree with someone, she can still recognize that they have the same goals. Unlike Damon, Diana herself is stated to dislike drama and sees no reason to cause strife due to differing views. Which is the literal opposite of Damon's talent and how he even developed it. Which, like, it's not in the script, but you cannot get more on the nose than that. And that point is doubly relevant because in all honesty, Damon and Diana have the same reason for being at the academy, to find their people. This is obvious on Damon's part, barring the numerous references across his bios. He legitimately spells it out for us. However, for Diana, it's a lot less explicit, rather based on an assessment of the fact that she never mentioned her friends in Eden's Island, only speaking of her clients, despite her bio stating it was her friends who got her her start. Add on to that the fact that she sees everyone as a friend by the end of the prologue trial, and it's pretty clear that both of them are seeking companionship in this class, though this manifests in opposite directions. Damon, isolated by his talent, wanted to find his equals directly because he's an ultimate. Diana, also isolated by her talent, wants to find her equals despite being an ultimate. And there is of course the fact Diana is defending Damon. That if nothing else just proves how different the two of them can be, even if they both have the same goals. Damon treats most of the students as a lost cause from the get-go. But Diana genuinely keeps standing up for them. After voicing her mind, she's able to convince them to at least bring them along, even if most of them are less than eager. So the class make their way out and to the Alpha Sanctuary. Making our way to the Alpha Sanctuary, we see Winona straggling behind the group, talking to her. We can see her criticize how easily everyone's latched onto Akure, which highlights that she won't be playing along, as well as the fact that, especially given she didn't speak up during the closing argument, she's probably just going to stay hands off during the killing game. Winona's approaching it as a game of attrition, and I suspect her character arc will be about her realizing she needs to take action. The class eventually gets to the tree room, where Tozu interrupts John's attempts to open the shutter, furious he's been upstaged. However, after some bickering, he offers them two pieces of information. The first one are the rules for the game with some interesting details. Firstly, the use of the term of or unwilling participants implies that some of the people likely didn't attend Eden's Garden Academy hoping to become a student. Some may have been invited on different grounds, and some may have not even been given the option of saying no. The next thing to note is the fact that destroying equipment seemingly can be excused, likely to a better murder. This could potentially set up Ulysses being forced to help the masterminds, as his meticulous note-taking would be a good substitute for broken cameras. There's also how when discouraging attacking Tozu and Mera, Tozu is the only one actually crossed out as a no-go, as if Mera is an afterthought to him and the mastermind. The most interesting thing, however, is how the rules about guilty students are phrased. Specifically, they're vague enough to allow for a multitude of possibilities. Guilty students are those responsible for a student dying, which raises the question of what responsibility is. Is it killing someone? Convincing someone to kill someone else or themselves? Not to mention how the criteria for passing a trial is just to vote for a guilty student. The possibility they could vote for someone who is guilty, but uninvolved in whatever murder the trial was focused on. After going through the rules, everyone asks just why even bother with them, which prompts Tozu to bring up the Stanford prison experiment and compare it to this current killing game. Now, it's likely there's something to this, but it's not like I have anything to say, right? <laughs> Yeah, believe it or not, I have a vested interest in psychiatry, and with that comes a massive disappreciation for this middling roleplay session labeled as an experiment. The Stanford Prison Experiment fundamentally sucks and has done nothing but serve to feel circle jerks about how we always get corrupted by a 40 and that we're the real virus, you guys. And on a surface level, you could argue that this killing game, as a successor to Kara's and the Prison Experiment, both serve to showcase how being given a 40 in the form of an ultimate title or becoming a warden invariably corrupts people. But honestly, the biggest similarities are in just how they fundamentally fail to prove any of their points, for the reasons I'll explain now. 1. The Stanford Prison Experiment lacked an independent variable. Yeah, when Zimbardo was asked what he was even trying to measure, he couldn't answer. It's the most important part of an experiment and he just didn't have one. In this way, the killing game is similar to just how vague everything is. What's actually being recorded? Something like how long it takes for everyone to kill each other? Something subjective like brutality? There isn't any concrete data they're getting, just that the game is happening. There weren't any independent fur bodies involved is the second point. Any of the researchers in the experiment invariably got involved in enforcing the prison model. So by the time the experiment 
tournament had ended, terminated, all of them were personally involved in the game. It's very clear, given the fact that Tozu and Mera are in the thick of it, there is nobody acting as a third party to just observe. Of course, you could say there is indeed someone advising the Viceroy Tozu, but with the implication that this game is meant to succeed and avenge Keras, it's likely even they would have a deep personal stake in it. Free, and most importantly, there was an extremely apparent observer effect. Several of the guards reported acting specifically to produce the results that Zimbardo wanted. With the wide array of cameras, the fact that everyone expects everyone else to play along and be friends, and the chance that this game is indeed being televised or broadcasted, this makes it clear that the students will act very differently than if they were simply isolated from the world around them. All of these points contribute to show that the Stanford Prison Experiment and this killing game are meaningless by failing to create an environment where the effects of being an ultimate can be seen and observed, there are no genuine conclusions to be reached to try and discredit the UTP. And this game has become just like Kara's killing game, the very one the masterminds wanted to avenge. A killing game with no purpose. A killing game for the sake of killing. The demo then ends with Tozu opening up the area, warning the students of a secret weapon hidden inside. Given that John has already said he's ventured inside, this will likely be brought up in the trial, though I doubt he'd have taken it by now. Wolfgang is surprisingly earnest about finding it and venturing forward, very obviously wanting to make sure they're even by all knowing about it than by rather trying to keep the class away. This shows that he doesn't completely trust the cast since he doesn't just try and leave it be, but he's smart enough to know they should at least be level, so there's no information to take advantage of. The cast enter the sanctuary and scene. That's it. Just before we talk about the teaser, however, I have a few observations. Firstly, let's take a look at this map labeled by my good friend Charm. What's interesting to me is this massive gap in the middle of the floor plan. Suspiciously massive, really. Given the easter egg of Tozu's shadow in the supply room, I'm honestly expecting Tozu and Mera to have a hideout here. Secondly, I just want to note that so far in the demo and the prologue, Eva never speaks in a way that can be interpreted as a lie. Questions, observations, and opinions. It's very hard to sneak a lie into those without being obvious. However, there is an exception. When Eva speaks about herself, she does so with complete confidence despite the chance of her being distrusted, which is a very high chance, mind you. Whether it be talking about her title or promising not to trick others, she doesn't hesitate in saying what I truly believe to be the truth. So, that's it for the demo. But there's one more thing to talk about, a pretty gnarly discovery regarding the teaser. Let's roll. Let's start things off fast. We've got a transcription for the lyrics of the teaser. Here they are. By being 15 words in total, there's quite a lot to unpack. Firstly, the line about standing where it all began feels like a reference to the Alpha Sanctuary, as if it was the area where the first murder occurs in both this killing game and its predecessor. I also want to say that we may be seeing the previous game in reverse. The prologue had us investigate the last murder. And as each chapter passes by, we go from the penultimate murder to the first. Maybe. Or we just see hints at the first murder in chapter 1, and then we get to the last one in chapter 6, where we have to reinvestigate Kara's murder and the whole previous killing game. I don't know. The way our cast interacts with this killing game and the last one could go in a million different directions. The second line, taking back what's mine, I'll be free, is fascinating. To me, it represents a multitude of perspectives. The masterminds of this game running it to be free of the desire for vengeance due to the UTP's involvement in the first killing game. The students seeking to be free of this game by outlasting it or even killing one another. It truly really shows how even those orchestrating this game are stuck. From the masterminds and Mera single-mindedly chasing revenge to Tozu potentially attempting to relive his glory days in the first killing game game. Like the Stanford experiment, they succumb to their roles, think to the overarching reach of those with authority, the UTP. These two lines paint a clear picture. This academy with its amenities and age is a reminder of the previous killing game and the injustice of it being covered up, juxtaposed by the injustice of this game. There is also the song itself. It sounded a bit off, so I reversed it and let me just play it for you.
Crazy, right? That's all I have to say. If you want to weigh in on what I said, please do leave a comment. Well, I'll see you when I do. Probably when chapter one releases. Um, you know, it's raining so hard that like the lights in my kitchen went out. That's crazy, right? Um, that doesn't have anything to do with this video. Uh, first, I just want to say thanks to Bob for helping me with like figuring out Premiere Pro. This is my first Premiere Pro video, by the way. Um, Charm for the map and Lo for helping me out with like just like putting my brain together when it came to Damon Storm. I really appreciate you guys. Anyone else who I didn't mention, you're dead to me.